This co-ed is studying economics. Her teacher for this lecture is a computer. The computer has become a dominant force in education. In the hands of a skilled teacher, it can present with pictorial clarity the most difficult concepts or replace the teacher as a source of facts. The demand for education is creating new colleges at the rate of one a week. Can we find the faculties to staff them when the class of 01 enters college? The president of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. In my opinion, by carefully combing the world, you might find enough qualified teachers to staff one very small university. And in 10 years, you won't, won't be able even to find that. More schools and more students. These elements are certain. But what of the quality of education in the 21st century? Class of 01, the year 2001, may number 15 million students. To teach, rather than simply spew facts at such enormous numbers, will require wholly new educational theories and technologies. One approach is that of a multimedia building, such as this one at Penn State. At the core of the building is this electronic library and control center. From here, film, slides, and television, either live or taped, are piped on call into all four of the wedge-shaped lecture halls that wheel about the hub of the building. Experts in a variety of fields are recorded on videotape. Their lectures are delivered to small classes on a number of different campuses. Each lecture hall holds as many as 400 students. Some lectures are delivered by pre-recorded tapes. Others have a live instructor who can call forth films, tapes, or slides to illustrate his lectures. More than 20 courses, everything from accounting to zoology. Thus, a lecture on child psychology takes on an added dimension when the relationship between mother and child can be seen rather than simply stated by an instructor. Carl likes water? Carl likes it. Carl likes it. Sarah spilled water? Did Sarah spill the water? Hey, kiddo. <laughs> now you note in these shots, not only is the child contracting what the mother says, but the mother is expanding what the child says. So that you get the... Half of the class of 01 may be on branch campuses located miles from the university. Additional students will be taught without packing them into already crowded classrooms. Today, 20 branches are tied to Penn State. The university's finest professors can thus reach thousands of students rather than the few who might jam into a single lecture hall. And go on in this form and form a fabric that is open. I'd like to talk a little bit about stream patterns. Dr. Newell has been doing some work with computers and he's trying to, to program computers to simulate human problem solving. But at 100 miles an hour, a coconut can be rather mean. And so it's a good idea in a hurricane to stay out of the region where there are liable to be coconuts picked up by the wind. And after all, there are some good effects because it... Penn State's closed circuit allows the students to talk back, to dispute theories, to ask questions of a live teacher miles away. Looks like we've got hurricanes pretty well covered there now. I don't know whether we cleared everything up or not. If we didn't, why, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, what's the average area of the uh, eye of a hurricane? Well, the area, of course, the, the eye varies quite a bit. Actually, the eye gets better developed as the storm moves out of the tropics. Uh, in general, the eye, I would say, 10 or 15 mile diameter. Of course, to get the area there, half of 15 is 7 and a half, and pi r squared, so 7 and a half times pi would be about 160 or 170 square miles covered by this hurricane. The purpose of this exercise not only lectures, but laboratory demonstrations also can be presented. 
The static picture of an experiment in a lab manual is replaced by a vivid demonstration that every student can see in detail on a nearby television screen. Our research purposes. When the pituitary gland is exposed, it can be identified by its peculiar pink color. How effective is the teacher in an electronic confrontation with the student? Studies show that students taught by television achieve as much as those given face-to-face -face instruction. Not only campuses, but many university systems will be hooked into central computer centers. This one at MIT has serviced 54 schools in six states. Thus, even the smallest school can join the computer revolution. But some feel the computer may destroy the educational process. A man once said, this invention of yours will produce forgetfulness in the minds of those who learn it, causing them to neglect their memory. The fearful speaker was Socrates. The object of his fears, writing. Will our fears about the computer be equally misplaced? Well, one of the roles that a computer might play and that we're investigating in a very serious way is the possibility that dialogues of a very rich nature can be developed and made available in the library of a computer. You call it the memory, but let me call it the library of the computer. If such a thing is possible, and the experiments we're doing lead us to think it is possible, then the student could come to a point where he needs to talk to somebody, sit down with a console that could have audio tapes, that could ask him questions, and in examining the answers which he gives to these questions, can say, look, but you missed a point here you really should go and read Veblen, or you should read something else. And in that way, he would have an interaction with not just a mechanized computer, but really with a person, a faculty member who's really thought about the idea of questioning and having a dialogue with a student, and what kind of responses a student might make, and what kind of helps he might need in proceeding further in his study. If the students could have a mechanism whereby they could go through the kinds of things they want to learn and, and are capable of learning on their own, then the faculty time could be uh, spent on that 20% or 30% of the questions that can't be handled in some sort of anticipated way in the computer program. The faculty will still give lectures. Lectures are a very powerful way of interesting people and giving them a feeling not only of the content but the style of the subject. A physics lecture or lecture is differently from a chemistry lecture or a humanities lecture. He sees a physicist or a sociologist or a philosopher in action. It gives him a picture of what it's like to be a philosopher and it's stimulating. One of our most durable traditions is the four-year college. CBS News correspondent Daniel Shore spoke of this with the U.S. Commissioner of Education. We assume that to have a bachelor's degree it takes four years. Uh, probably the element of higher education that keeps this uh, uh, assumption going more than any other is that it takes four years to develop a good football or basketball team. But in actuality, um, the, we ought to be much more flexible. Colleges and universities uh, ought to have some students who may take five, six, eight years to achieve a bac bachelor baccalaureate degree. Uh, others, uh, two and a half or three. Uh, we don't fit the education to the student very much now. We fit the student to the education. I suspect that uh, by the year uh, 2000, we'll begin to do uh, some of the former. With the explosion of university population, Will we need larger schools, more schools? What will happen and how will you absorb all these students? I think the emphasis will be on larger schools. There will be a growing number of schools, but my guess is there are not many more universities. Um, the largest growing enterprise in higher education right now is the community college and will probably continue to be for the next few years. Uh, there were 50 new ones this year. There'll be 50 new ones next year, one a week. Community colleges are growing out in the United States. This is Oakland Community College in suburban Detroit. Authorized in 1964, it was teaching 4,000 students the following year. Drawing a comparison between that essay... The two-year college serves a different need than the four-year school. And I think we have pointed out to you in the past that there are a number of tapes within the checkout center that are... Most of its students will not go on in higher education. Rather, they will enter the labor force as highly skilled technicians to meet the needs of an increasingly complex society. Oakland gives courses in automotive technology, law enforcement, nursing, radio and television repair, as well as English, math, and foreign languages. Oakland's approach to education also is influenced by technology. 
These students are drawing an entire day's classwork from the library. The tapes, films, and slides make up a step-by-step -step learning program for each course. Included are lectures, demonstrations, and questions that demand student response. The system enables students to learn at their own pace and places the burden of educational progress on their own shoulders. Each student has his own study carol or learning laboratory. The theory is that facts can be transmitted by machine just as well as by a live teacher. Is less concerned with improving the efficiency of the work people do than with how they get along. Both policies are fraught with peril. In this recording, we shall examine the background which has led the United States into this dilemma and review the alternatives which U.S. policy can follow. Questions the machine cannot answer are fielded by a live instructor. Excuse me, Mr. Fames. Could you explain the uh, Burgess theory, please, to me? Well, it was the theory of the way cities grew. Now, in one sense, the teacher is an extension of the machine. In another, he is that educational ideal, a personal tutor available to every student at every moment of the school day. In these discussion groups, called small assembly sessions, the machine again gives way to human discourse which is still the most valuable part of the educational process. The question is, how much conformity can you have in a society, and how much diversity? Are you going to make pig pen take a bath, or is this important? Here, machine-delivered facts are examined with a knowledgeable instructor who encourages interpretation and applications needed in a world beyond the ivied halls. True. So the question then becomes, is it a social good that you make pig pen take a bath? Yes. This is one side of the argument, the other but, side. Right. What's the other side? Perhaps he's not, perhaps the uh, society uh, doesn't really uh, isn't really interested whether pig pen takes a bath or not. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's his other achievements that he has. Fine, but how, how much? Can you do it? Ah, Does it make any difference if you sure, take a bath? Sure, sure, it makes it, uh, a difference. The everyday individual would be is, looked down upon right. if they didn't take a bath. The class of 01 will be big, far too big for the estimated crop of teachers. So acute is the problem that by 1970. The Carnegie Foundation estimates that the nation will need almost 36,000 more teachers than will be available. Are you tired of clicking through the commercials? Watch Commercial Free on Patreon. The link is below this video in the description box. And now back to the show. How many college teachers will be needed in the 21st century is anybody's guess. It is apparent that technology will be not only an adjunct to education, but an absolute necessity. A preview of an electronic teacher of the future can be seen at the University of Illinois. This is Plato for Program Logic for Automatic Teaching Operation. Plato can supply facts, ask questions, grade answers, and teach virtually any subject. Here it provides a biology student with a pictorial description of the female reproductive cycle. The heart of Plato is this computer, which has a memory large enough to serve 5,000 students. The actual lesson is contained in this taped program. Plato keeps a complete record of student performance, everything from the time a student spends on each page of the electronic book to the answers he gives to its questions. Checking a Plato lecture is Professor Donald L. Bitzer, who heads the program. He points out that the teacher will not be replaced by these devices, for the teacher must program the computer with the information it eventually delivers to the student. The computer selects pre-programmed slides from a bank and flashes them on individual television screens. It also talks to the student by writing letters and numbers on the screen. 
In a physics course, Plato reveals its sophistication by posing questions that can only be answered in a laboratory. The question is to determine the metal of which a crown is made. Plato's computer produces the necessary equipment for the experiment. It allows the student to plunge the crown into a vat of water and measure the overflow. Then to place it on a scale and weigh it in air. With these two facts established, the student needs only a table listing the densities of a number of materials in order to select the right answer. In this manner, a basic physics concept that formally demanded a fully equipped laboratory and instructors is taught by the machine. The lab and the instructors are not, however, dispensed with. They are still available to the student, but for more creative work than basic problem solving. It has been said that the Most educators do not readily accept technological innovation. We spoke with the education editor of the New York Times, Fred M. Heckinger. I would say that education has used uh, television, for instance, less than almost any other field has because the teachers are trained to go about their business in the same old way. They, uh, they recognize books as an education aid, but they don't recognize the new uh, media at all. And uh, their training hasn't been, uh, hasn't been adapted to it. Uh, if you look at uh, the way teachers are being trained today on any level, you find that after they've completed all the work they were supposed to do, there might be a course or two in what educators call uh, audiovisual aids. Well, this is a little as though you trained a teacher uh, to teach whatever he or she is supposed to teach without ever introducing a book. And then at the end say, uh, now we'll give you a uh, two-credit course in the use of books. Until we, we use the technology in the whole teacher training uh, process, uh, we don't get that kind of, uh, of application. Our children learn it. Children uh, absorb it almost automatically because they live in this kind of world, but their teachers don't. Most uh, of the present teaching establishment, most of the intellectuals in the universities, uh, sort of have a feeling that uh, what they consider gadgetry is really not part of their life. They rather pride themselves in not uh, using them. But the next generation, I think, will. In 1890, after Darwin's death, a Dutch army surgeon by the name of Dubois. This fledgling teacher at Stanford University is interning in a program called micro-teaching. A TV camera tapes his performance before a sort of mini class. Then with a teaching coach, the intern can evaluate his own performance. The Pithecanthropus erectus. Yeah, let's, let's take a look at the tape. See, uh, try to picture it from the student's point of view as to you know, what they're seeing the lesson is about. Okay. In 1890, after Darwin's death, a Dutch army surgeon by the name of Dubois... Technology provides the would-be teacher with teaching techniques after he has earned his bachelor's degree. Thus, the major effort of his college training was spent in gaining an in-depth knowledge of his chosen subject. Of a creature which he termed the Pithecanthropus erectus. Okay, hold it. Hold you, it. you know what bothers me all the way through? I, I feel like when I see myself, I'm just up there talking. I'm giving the lesson. Mm -hmm. well, is, is that that? It what? doesn't make me feel like the kids are learning. They're not involved in the process of learning. How how am let's, I able to? Let's watch. I think it was just just this shift from you dominating it to their working for you, working at it, we'll, we'll get more mileage out of it. For the next lesson, when you do it again, let's get to the idea quickly. Mm -hmm. Let's not divert them with the origin of man and, and the job of man and the size of the... Let's get to the idea of language mm -hmm. as soon as you can. How did the first men first communicate their thoughts Tony? Pictures. Pictures. Dan, you had your hand up. Um, grunts, sounds. Okay, grunts, sounds. Very good. What else? 
Technological innovation will shake many traditional educational practices. Okay, Even good. the ancient motion. Socratic technique of the lecture may be altered. The U.S. Education Commissioner. Audiovisual devices of various kinds will enter to some extent into higher education and, and uh, provide a resource for the student to, to learn what he needs to know. Uh, the lecture system, uh, as a basis of passing on information, seems to me highly inefficient. Most universities depend on it today for passing on information. Now, I think the le lecture system has its place and that there are, there are interpretations which a great personality can give and flavor of meaning that's awfully important for a student to have. I'd advocate bottling in film uh, some of the great professors we have and using them uh, in the 21st century. If the instructor loses this role of giving the basic information to the student, then what becomes the role of the instructor in the new university? The instructor's role is uh, primarily one of intelligent conversation about knowledge. And uh, this takes place uh, either on an individual basis or in a seminar or in a place where uh, a, a group that's small enough so that people are tossing around ideas related to a subject on which they have some focus and about which they've learned something. And it seems to me that, uh, that the instructor provides the stimulation for that conversation. He provides uh, the element of perspective in it. He tries to guide it in some direction. Um, he calls forth by asking really sticky questions, uh, what Socrates called forth when he was going about the same business uh, more than 2,000 years ago. You will remember that Horace formulated these two possible aims. Can a machine ever replace a man like this? a great so teacher. Long, At the University of Michigan, the brilliant philosophy professor, Abraham Kaplan, transmits not merely facts and theories, but attitudes of mind and styles of thinking. Art either instructs or entertains. If it entertains, then it is condemned by the moralist. If it instructs, it's condemned by the audience for which it is intended, finds itself bored by it. And not so, say the new classicists. We really can please best by way of the moral content. Cornier, great French dramatist, classicist, explicitly states that precisely in order to please the greatest number of people, we must give our art a moral purpose. Most men are moral. That is the natural condition of man. Immorality is unnatural, monstrous, a perversion, a distortion. Something has grown twisted pathological. So the point is, it would be a poor work of art. And why would it be poor if it were immoral? Because in order to convey that immorality, it would have to distort nature. So much then for the moralistic aim and content of neoclassic aesthetics. Do you have any questions? Hopefully the class of 01 will have its great teachers to stimulate with passion and imagination. But technology is revolutionizing education, for the needs of the 21st century make such a revolution necessary. There are dangers in machine-made education, conformity and orthodoxy among others. But there are great benefits in an education properly aided by technology. The vast numbers of students will demand teaching efficiencies never before needed. But the ultimate benefit will come from the ability of the machine to increase the rate of learning. For the class of 01, this will mean teachers who teach less to permit learners to learn more. Every era has produced its great teachers. The 21st century, too, will demand its share of men who pour out their hearts and their minds to students who are willing to learn.
The 21st Century was filmed and edited under the supervision and control of CBS News.